Prof, it's always a pleasure having you on the show. Good evening. Let's talk about this talk about um, this vaccine or the potential of a vaccine because in the last two weeks or so, even internationally, we've seen a huge drive. I believe there's over 150 trials currently underway globally for a possible vaccine. What is this rush about? So we, we know that we need to have some level of immunity in order to control this virus. And since we do not have natural immunity, we will look to a vaccine. There is a lot of optimism that a vaccine could be made against this virus because of the stability of its genetic sequence. In other words, the level of variation in this virus is actually quite low, especially when you consider it in, connect, in relation to viruses like HIV. Mm. But it takes many years to develop a vaccine, to test a vaccine, to ensure that it has long-lasting protective effects. So that's a long process normally. In COVID, we have seen some amazing innovations to try and fast track that process. Mm. In fact, if we look right now, there are something like seven or eight trials already underway by major companies and research organizations. And so I'm pretty optimistic that we'll see a vaccine, but I am not optimistic that we're going to see it anything earlier than the next year, a year and a half. Yeah. And I wonder when this process is expedited, because depending on which world leaders you listen to, some have suggested that, uh, let's take the, the, the likes of the U.S. president, who, of course, is promising Americans that he will find, um, he'll ensure that a vaccine to COVID-19 is developed as soon as possible. And one gets the impression that he believes this is something that could be done within the space of months and not necessarily uh, a year that you're talking about. So what are the gaps that exist in the system if this process is circumvented? So I think, uh, you know, firstly, it's good to get your information from a trustworthy and truthful source. And when we look at the available information that's uh, on vaccines, we look to the World Health Organization, which has produced the most reliable and scientifically valid uh, information and evidence. And we now have some clarity about the way in which a vaccine research is going to go in this field. And I think we're getting some clarity about what the designs of the trials are going to be. Mm. The big concern is that we may end up with a vaccine that's effective, but perhaps not safe, or a vaccine that's effective but only effective for a short period. So that's the big concern, and a shortcut in the process may compromise us in trying to find a truly long-lasting, effective vaccine. There are, of course, very serious to debates to be had, whether it's around ethics or even morally, when it comes to the role that pharmaceutical companies are going to play, even in the development of this vaccine. And its ability to be able to reach every single person uh, who, who may need it. Are those the kind of conversations that are already taking place, or do you think it's going to be left until the point where there's something tangible to talk about? No, so those discussions have already started. In fact, the World Health Organization has already convened a group that's looking at this issue about global access. What we don't want to end up with is we end up with a, having a vaccine but then we can't get hold of it. Uh, and if a vaccine is being uh, is shown to be effective, there's always a lag time from the time you got an effic efficacious vaccine to the time that they build the factories and you know, enable the factories to make enough quantities of the vaccine to vaccinate people. So this is a major concern because this is a worldwide pandemic. And so the World Health Organization has started that deliberation and those discussions. And they are in the process of developing a statement that will guide how uh, we could uh, distribute in a more fair way 
a vaccine that is shown to be efficacious. Sure. And I want to, just to get your thoughts on the current rate of infections that uh, we're seeing in the country. There have been some concerning developments. Uh, the Western Cape, the increasing numbers there. There's some issues that officials in the Eastern Cape have raised about not necessarily being able to contain COVID-19. When you look at it, is this part of what you had anticipated according to your models? Are we still on track? or um, are things moving a bit quicker than, than you may have anticipated? Yeah, so you know, I don't do mathematical modeling, so I just use the epidemiology to understand what the trends are and what they're likely to be. And this is very much in keeping with what I anticipated. Uh, if anything, the Western Cape uh, and the way in which the number of cases has been going up is slightly ahead of the curve that I anticipated. We, we know that we were never going to beat this virus, and that was not the goal, and I, I clarified that. Instead, we were going to try and flatten the curve, and the reason for that was very simple, that we do not have uh, natural immunity or vaccine, and so we are all vulnerable, and we, we all carry that risk. And we know in the nature of South African society that, 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 that there is going to be the potential for this virus to spread. So what is going to happen is we are going to see uh, areas where the virus will uh, manifest itself in a particular burst of cases. I called it in my original presentation the flames. We will see these flames and they will be all over, little flames. And in the Western Cape, we're seeing particularly quite a few flames right now. Mm. Central to that is that when we see a flame, we go in, we deal with it, so it doesn't become a raging fire. And the Western Cape has been doing a reasonably good job of that. All right. Uh, Professor Salim Abdul-Karim.